All right, so good afternoon, everybody. I'm really happy to welcome and introduce Matt Bracken, who's our speaker for today's uh, seminar. Matt is a marine biologist and a professor at the University of California, Irvine, and visiting us this week at the Day. His uh, work is on the, um, the links between uh, processes at the ecosystem and at the community level, and this is what he's going to talk about today. And so without further ado, Matt, the floor is yours. Gracias. Uh, uh, hola. Um, you know, I, I, I realize that this is the first talk I've given since the pandemic. The last time I actually, I mean, I've given some remote seminars, but this is the first one I've given since about the fall of 2019. So thank you for bearing with me and, and inviting me to come here. So one of the things that I'm really interested in in my research program is understanding the roles that consumers play in communities and ecosystems and especially trying to explore some of the things they do that don't involve consumption. And so that's what I want to highlight today. But before I get started, um, like any research enterprise, there are a whole bunch of different people to thank. Various co-authors on some of the aspects that we'll be talking about today, people who've helped me in the field, in the lab, um, funding agencies. And I per particularly want to acknowledge the fact that Various components of this work were carried out on the traditional ancestral unceded territory of the Namkig, Pawtucket, Massachusetts, Grattan, Rancheria, Coast Miwok, Ahashman, and Tongva people. So one of the facts that we're forced to grapple with right now is the fact that humans are altering the diversity of life on Earth. So we see all of these high-profile papers highlighting the fact that we are now in an age of extinction, that um, there is this emerging mass extinction in the oceans, that what we're experiencing now might, in fact, be the sixth mass extinction. And if you actually look at the data, and I know you're not necessarily supposed to combine fossil data with current data, but there are a lot of things that point toward this type of trend. We're currently experiencing the fastest rate of extinction and a lot of people agree on this. That has happened any time over the history of the Earth. And um, here is an example of the type of work that I do to understand the consequences of global change and what people are doing and how that's affecting diversity. So um, we've looked, for example, at invaders and how this is an invasive seaweed species and how as its abundance increases, we see declines in local species diversity. And as humans are altering diversity like this, it's consequently affecting how biological systems function. And you know, this is something that I'm sure we're all aware of and studying. Um, but again, there are these papers on functions of biological diversity in an age of extinction, on impacts on ecosystems and human well-being. And um, this is a particularly interesting and, and informative graphic that comes from this paper by Shahid Naeem, Emmett Duffy, and Erica Zavaleta. It's kind of cool because here you have these transformations. So these are changes associated with agriculture, which is the major driver. Land use change is the major driver of biodiversity change on the land. So here you have forests and savannas being converted into various forms of agriculture. Or in marine systems, um, changes associated with fishing and then how that's altering all of these different processes. Um, and we might ask, as species are being driven extinct, which species are at greatest risk? And there's this really nice summary in the oceans. If you look at which species, so this is in terms of size and mobility, which species were impacted by these extinction events? So this is over the last 60 million years. These are the made big five mass extinction events. So here's like Ordovician all the way up to the Cretaceous. Um, and then the modern extinction event. If you look at which species have been impacted either over really long time scales or over the past 50 million or 60 million years in extinctions, um, there really isn't any pattern in terms of size or mobility until you get to this current extinction event. And what we're seeing is that relative to the past, large and mobile species are going disproportionately extinct. And so which ones are those? Those are the consumers. 
Okay? So these are the species that are being impacted the most. And so we might say then, what are the consequences of the loss of consumers for how systems function? And specifically here, I'll be talking about the functioning of marine ecosystems. And so the roles of consumers are typically viewed in a trophic context. Basically, consumers eat their prey. And here is a classic example of that from the coastline where I've lived and worked for many years, where we have sea otters eating sea urchins, sea urchins eating kelp in this classic trophic cascade. Um, so historically, otters enhanced the abundances of kelp via this trophic cascade, where otters were abundant, they would keep the sea urchins in check, and the kelp would flourish. But then um, in the late 1700s, Russian fur traders came to the coast of Western North America, and they hunted the otters virtually to extinction. Um, sea uh, urchin populations increased, and they decimated the kelp. Um, and so that's usually the way we think about extinctions and near extinctions and how, uh, of consumers and how they affect these systems. But what I want to suggest today are there are some other roles that we need to think about in terms of what they're likely to do and the loss of consumers is likely to do to how systems are working. Um, so my question here today is what are the consequences of the loss of consumers for the functioning of marine ecosystems? And as I was thinking about how to present this in the context of, of my research, um, I was like, um, this is, this is a, a picture, actually, I'm looking out to sea, standing at one of our University of California research reserves on the central California coast. And, um, you know, this is sort of big picture, but then I like to look at things um, uh, at a more fine scale at a, in systems that I can actually experimentally manipulate. And so let's go from this big scale and look at the organisms that are actually there. And literally, this is what I saw when I was standing, taking at that picture, and then looked at my feet. So you have all of these different organisms and thinking about the roles that they're playing in the system. So we can look at these intertidal organisms and come up with some hypotheses about how they might be interacting with each other. So you have this starfish here. If you look closely, there are some snails crawling around here on the rocks. The snails are eating seaweeds. There are also microalgae. You can't see those, but we know they're there. Surf grasses here growing around, or nutrients in the water, and we can think about the relationships between these different factors in the system. I want to drill down a little bit further to make it even simpler. This is a system that I've been working in for many years, looking at consumers, snails, and similar sorts of organisms that eat seaweeds and microalgae, and then the nutrients that are also involved in that system from the bottom up. Okay, so let's think about that local food web. We know that herbivores eat algae. Here's a picture from one of the experiments that I'll talk to you about later. Um, we use these travertine tiles as experimental units a lot, and so here you can see one of those tiles. The side that has the snails has no algae growing on it. The side without snails has this huge algal growth. So herbivores definitely eat algae. Um, so there's top-down processes. We also have bottom-up processes where external nutrient inputs enhance algal growth. So here's a picture from an estuary where um, there's a lot of nutrients coming into the system and you have these green algal blooms. So usually it's this top-down versus bottom-up processes. But there are other links in this system. And one of the things that I've been saying for a long time is how consumers are potentially changing, altering, recycling nutrients in the system and mediating their availability. And so here are a whole bunch of different grazer groups, litterine snails, limpets, chitons, turbine snails, all of which are recycling nitrogen, excreting ammonium at the local scale in these tide pools. And I'll talk a little bit more later about this variability. Okay, so consumers could also facilitate the growth of algae by excreting nutrients. And so that's an example of a type of unanticipated effect of consumers that I want to talk about here today. So I'll break this into four parts. First, highlighting how consumers can enhance algal growth. Second, talk about how we need to partition the consumptive and facilitative effects of grazers on algae. Um, this would be a sort of experimental design um, type considerations. And then a couple of examples. First, highlighting the importance of community composition um, and how that affects these relationships. And then um, take this interaction into the field and see what we see. Okay, so let's talk about this first one, about consumers and algal growth. 
So as I just showed you, we have all these different consumer species. These are all um, grazing mollusks, litterines, limpets, chitons, turbans, snails, all of which are actually excreting nutrients um, as a metabolic byproduct. So consumers excrete ammonium as a waste product. And in fact, I've just changed it. So it's not just snails, but all of them. This is actually a pretty diverse grazer group in this system, all of which are contributing nutrients, recycling nutrients in the system. So consumers affect nitrogen availability, but then the question is, how does it affect algal growth? And this actually gets kind of complicated for a couple reasons, um, one of which is the fact that the nitrogen that they are consuming actually comes from the things that they consume, so it's sort of a closed recycling system, and I'll get to that a little bit more in a minute. But let's just think about the possibility that consumer-mediated nitrogen availability could affect algal growth, and like I said, this is something I've been working on at this point now for over two decades, which is kind of frightening. Um, but I started, when I first got into looking at this, um, I was looking at mussels, which are ubiquitous bivalves growing on temperate rocky shores around the world, um, and how they affect the growth of seaweeds that live in close association with them. And the bottom line is that if you look over time, this is percent growth, um, where mussels are present in tide pools, the seaweeds grow much better than when they're absent. And that's related to the fact that ammonium loading, um, the ammonium that's being excreted by these mussels, is directly related to nitrogen assimilation by the seaweeds. So the ammonium that they're providing is assimilated and then translated into enhanced growth rates. But, as I'm sure we can all sort of appreciate, uh, mussels don't actually eat seaweeds, right? They're filter feeders. They're getting their food from the water column. Um, what they're actually doing that's kind of cool, and this will come up again later, is that they're mediating a spatial subsidy. So they're bringing in new nitrogen from outside the system by filter feeding, and then they're recycling that nitrogen and making it locally available. So that still begs the question, can herbivore-mediated nutrient inputs have similar effects? And so that brings us to part two, which is how do we actually partition these consumptive and facilitative effects? So my typical plan for doing this, and I'll show you how I've done it in microcosms and also in the field, is to use some sort of mesh screen or barrier that limits the snails they can't get across, but their excreted nitrogen can get across, and so that limits their access but, um, and allows me to separate them. So the snails can't get through, but the nutrients can. And so we can do these comparisons. Here, this is just ammonium concentrations in these. This is grazer present. This is the grazer barrier side of that same container. And then there are no grazer containers as well. And if you look at grazer present versus grazer barrier, um, there's no real difference in ammonium concentration, but they're much higher than the no grazer treatment. And then we can use subtraction to calculate um, these various components. So a consumptive effect here is grazer present minus grazer barrier, so grazer present minus grazer barrier, because the only difference here is the presence of the grazer, the nutrients are diffusing across. Calculate the facilitative effect, which is the grazer barrier side. It only has the nutrients, but it doesn't have the actual grazers present. And then the total effect is grazer present minus no grazer. And so it's important to realize that a lot of consumer manipulations are really doing this total effect manipulation, grazer present minus no grazer, but not partitioning these component aspects of it. So like I said, I've done this in lab microcosms. Um, these would be little like Tupperware containers, which is why they have blue tops on them. Um, I've also done this in, in the field. Um, in the second example, I'll show you of a case study of applying this. It'll use this design in the field. So we have grazers present grazers removed at the scale of whole tide pools, and then within the tide pools, I can use these tiles that are a nice, convenient substratum that I drill into the rock. And some of them have fences around them that limit access by the grazers, and some of them are open and the grazers can crawl around. So, but it's a very similar um, design where you, have, you can partition these consumptive and facilitative effects. Okay, so again, grazer barrier, grazer present, no grazers. Okay, 
So let's see how this works in action, starting with the importance of community composition. So the reason I want to think about community composition is grazers, when they're out there foraging, have a lot of different algal species to choose from. And this is an example from tide pools in New England before I moved to UC Irvine. I was a faculty member at Northeastern University in Boston. And so these are representative algae that grow and live out there. So the grazers could choose to eat Ascophyllum or Chondrus or Pyropia or Ulva or Fucus or any of the other algae that are growing there. And so what we're really thinking about is this type of an interaction with lots of different options. And that ends up being pretty important. So we started measuring, this was starting trying to figure out grazer impacts in the system. We started measuring, um, if you give them a choice, which ones are they choosing and which ones are they eating more? And so they were not really eating Ascophyllum or Chondrus. They eat a lot of um, Porphyra or Pyropia. They eat a lot of Ulva because they're these thin, easily chewed on um, algae. But then we started seeing these funny results. This is Fucus. And in fact, Fucus is exhibiting negative grazing. And we started trying to drill down on that. That's one of the reasons we started thinking about nutrient recycling and that possibility in this context. And so what I'm going to focus on are ulva, which is readily eaten, and then fucus, where we actually have these negative grazer effects, where it actually grows more um, in the presence of grazers than in the absence of grazers. So let's think about those two species more carefully. So ulva is highly palatable. Um, fucus may actually benefit from grazers. And so what I want to do is test how one seaweed species modifies the grazer effects on another species using this design that I showed you earlier. And in fact, it's a little more complicated than that because I wanted to combine an additive and replacement series design because that would allow me to avoid confounding seaweed density and community composition. So it not only is just ulva versus fucus, but it's low biomass fucus, high biomass fucus, low biomass ulva, high biomass ulva, and then fucus plus ulva, because the fucus plus ulva has twice the biomass. So I need to be able to account for the individual versus combined biomasses of the different species. So let's think about the effects of fucus on ulva. So remember, ulva is preferred to fucus, and snails eat a lot of ulva. That's what we see here. So this is ulva growth, right? So negative growth would be consumption. Um, and we see that regard, there, there are differences. In the absence of fucus, um, they actually eat less ulva because they're eating some of the fucus. But they do eat a lot of ulva. You can see these values range from about 50 to 75% over the few days that I was measuring these. And there's very little evidence for these facilitative effects. So the total herbivore effect, if they're eating ulva, pretty much is exactly the consumptive effect. Um, so there is enhanced consumption of ulva where fucus is present, because fucus isn't as readily consumed. All right, let's flip this around and think about the effects of ulva on fucus. So here's fucus growth um, as a percentage of initial mass. If you look at consumption, remember the other in the previous figure, these range from about 50 to 75 percent. They're eating much less fucus. Remember, it's not as palatable. Um, and in fact, they only eat um, an appreciable amount of fucus when there isn't any ulva around for them to eat. But this is where we start seeing these facilitative effects cropping up. So here, in the presence of ulva, we see a significant positive effect, a facilitative effect. And so the total herbivore effect here is slightly positive. It's not different from zero, but it's this combined combination of a negative consumptive effect, slightly negative consumptive effect, and a positive facilitation effect that gives us that total herbivore effect. So. Um, in this case, it's important to be able to distinguish the roles that the grazers are playing. So snails can, in fact, enhance local scale nutrient availability. Um, but the effect of that on seaweeds depends on community context. Um, it's clear here, though, that grazers can enhance the growth of less palatable seaweeds, especially when a more palatable species is present, because they're basically converting that the biomass, the nitrogen in the biomass of that more palatable species into a resource that the less palatable species can capitalize on. 
But, you know, this is in lab microcosms. Do these effects actually happen in the field? And I've been looking for a system to do this in, to explore these interactions in the field. And when I moved to California and started looking in the tide pools there, I said, well, this looks like a good candidate because, and this is actually when I went out to interview for the position, um, the people who were showing me around took me out to the tide pools at Crystal Cove State Park, and there were all these great grazers living in the tide pools there. And so I said, okay, this is a great place to, to start actually exploring some of these questions. And then I discovered my current playground. This is uh, little Corona del Mar, Corona del Mar Beach, which is about 15 minutes from our campus. It's close enough that I can bring undergrads out there to do work in the field easily. And as you can see, there are all these tide pools around um, to explore. And if you look in those tide pools, you can see lots of these grazers living there. So I've been playing around in this system for many years and trying to understand the effects of grazer abundance on nutrients and algae. So, now, so I'm conducting surveys of tide pools to look at snail abundances, snail densities, looking at ammonium concentrations by collecting water samples and using the phenol hypochlorite method. That's what they're measuring here in the lab. And then um, ramping up techniques for non-destructively assessing algal abundances using pulse amplitude modulated or PAM fluorometry um, because um, it's really well chlorophyll correlated to extracted chlorophyll values, as you can see here. So here's the dark adapted fluorescence value that you can measure. Basically, you take the fiber optic wand on the PAM fluorometer on a dark adapted sample, and you can take spot measurements. And they're really nicely correlated with destructively sampled chlorophyll, so I can non-destructively monitor algal standing stock biomass over time in response to experimental treatments. Okay, so here, um, this is the effects of grazer abundance with the relationship between grazer abundances and nutrient concentrations. And here you see snail abundances, the number of these turbine snails per square meter, and how that's related to ammonium concentrations. So snails don't just eat algae, they might help them by providing limiting nutrients. That's what we see here, this relationship. And we also see positive relationships between grazer abundances here and algal biomass. Um, now, this could be causal, but it could also be because the grazers are just going where the algae are. So this is why I need to set up an experiment. So the experimental approach involves manipulating grazer abundances and tide pools. So here you have grazer addition pools, control pools, where I just picked up and dropped the grazers, um, disturbed them a little bit, and then removal pools. So I, they were volume matched, so I had a set of tide pools um, and then figured out pools of equivalent volume and put them into sets and then randomly assign treatments, addition, control, or removal within those sets. And so I would take the grazers from a removal pool and then put it into the matched addition pool. And it's not as easy as going from here to here because those pools might actually be separated by like a quarter mile of beach. So I'd have to put them in a container and take them all the way down the beach. So it's not quite as nicely gridded as this. It's across this entire landscape here. Okay. Um, and then here, this just shows the, um, the effect of the treatments on abundance is what I want to focus on in this example, or this figure. So here's the abundance, the number per meter squared in the reduced ambient and addition herbivore treatments. And you can see that I was able to successfully create a gradient of herbivore abundances. Okay, and then within the tide pools, as I showed you earlier, manipulating grazer access, so plus grazer and minus grazer tiles. So here's what they look like in action. Here's the schematic that I showed you earlier. So here you can see little litterine snails crawling around on this tile, and this one doesn't have any snails on it at all because it's got a fence there. It does take quite a bit of maintenance. have to go out every summer. Two to five days is about right to maintain the treatment, um, but can definitely um, control grazer access within the tide pools. Um, and this is the fence effect, which is the number of the grazers on the unfenced tile minus the number of grazers on the fenced tile. Um, and that's what's shown here. And there isn't much of a fence effect on um, in tide pools where the herbivores have been reduced because there aren't that many herbivores on the tide pool. So it scales, the fence effect scales with herbivore treatment. So there's a strong effect in addition tide pools because they have a lot of herbivores there. Okay, and then finally, quantify the effects on photosynthetic biomass over, in this case, it was about a month and a half um, to see 
what effect this, these treatments had on the system. Okay. So the other sort of procedural aspect is that um, chlorophyll A was back calculated from pamphlerometry because midway through as algal accumulations increased, I had to change the settings on the instrument. So I had to, for each of those settings, I had to create this relationship. So all values are expressed as chlorophyll A concentrations. Um, I also put the tiles in the tide pools two months before the experiment so that algal communities could build up on the tiles. Um, and then there's um, two covariates, the yeah, immediate per, immediately prior chlorophyll concentration and the pool surface area to volume ratio because both of those affect subsequent chlorophyll concentrations in the pool. All right. So um, it turns out that the effect of herbivore exclusion or fences depends on the grazer removal treatment. Um, the fence effect here is the difference between the chlorophyll concentration inside the fence and the chlorophyll concentration outside the fence. So positive fence effect is associated with consumption. A negative fence effect in this case is associated with facilitation. And we find something that's rather puzzling. So in the removal treatments where herbivore abundances have been reduced, we find consumptive effects, but then as the grazers become more abundant, by the time we get to the grazer addition tide pools, then we see facilitative effects. So there's something interesting going on with the physical presence of grazers where there are actually higher algal abundances outside the fences than inside the fences, which is not what I'd predicted and which put me and my entire lab group on a completely different tap to try to figure out what was going on here. So herbivore removals result in stronger consumptive effects, facilitative effects are stronger where grazers are added, and I started trying to figure out like what's going on here and thinking about snails and nutrients and doing weird Google searches and some of the main things that come up look like this because people actually apparently like to let snails crawl over their faces to increase moisturization or something. Um, but it turns out that there's some really cool work linking snail slime to algal growth as well. So this is a paper that was published in Science in 1984 on stimulation of food species growth by limpet mucus. So I know, don't you wish it wasn't that easy to publish something in Science now? cool natural history studies and observations. Um, but so this is highlighting the fact that as snails and other, and limpets and other um, mollusks are crawling around on the rock, um, they're leaving this, um, this mucus or slime trail behind. They use this, it facilitates crawling, it helps them attach to the substratum, and it turns out that it creates a sticky trap that facilitates the recruitment of algae from the water onto the substratum. And so we started basically trying to figure out how to measure snail slime. Um, so we, the, the first step was to say, okay, maybe this is what's going on. And we set up another experiment. This is with, with the aid of a really good undergraduate. Um, so we put some tiles out there. Um, and we actually used had the lids off of them, but we built stainless steel lids so that we could keep some of the snails in some of the cages and um, out of some of the cages. But we put, we had five tiles of snails added, five tiles of snails excluded, and after one week, this is what we saw. Here again is this photosynthetic biomass, dark adapted F0 measurement from the fluorometer, higher algal biomass where the snails are present than in the control tiles after just one week. So they're definitely facilitating recruitment of algae from the water onto the benthos. And so that suggests that there are actually multiple mechanisms by which these grazers could facilitate microalgae by excreting or recycling ammonium and by mediating a spatial subsidy of pelagic microalgae onto the benthos, making them available for the grazers in the system. And so then we started trying to figure out how to measure slime. And there are a lot of different things that we tried, but I went to a talk by people who are working on um, marine snow. Does everyone, anyone know what marine snow is? It's the stuff that's drifting down from the photic zone down to the deep sea. And basically what they are is they're little globs of snot. And so the people who are measuring them use techniques that are designed for measuring mucus. 
Originally, this, this dye technique, which is using um, alcyon blue, was developed for measuring things like respiratory mucus and things like that. And then co-opted by the oceanographers for measuring marine snow. And now in our lab, we've modified it now for measuring snail slime. So um, we use this dye binding assay to measure the slime. And um, this shows the results of an experiment in the lab then, where we, um, we had four tiles with snails added, four tiles with snails excluded. Um, we let the snails crawl around and leave slime trails on them, and we can now measure the slime, and I'll show you those results in a minute. But after 24 hours, we took these tiles um, and rinsed them gently, removed the grazers, put them in containers, and then um, we took cultured phytoplankton and we um, dumped it over them. We aliquoted it over each of the tiles, let them dark adapt for 30 minutes, and measured, again, photosynthetic biomass. And over the snail, the ones that the snails crawled, again, we've shown this link again um, related to um, recruitment. So we've done this in the field, we've done it in the lab, we've showed the links to the algae. And um, We've also done some cool work looking at these different grazer groups and showing that there's variability in terms of the grazer groups and how much slime they produce. Um, and, a, and then we also know from what I showed you before that there's variability in terms of ammonium excretion. And so it turns out that some species that produce a lot of slime, like these litterine snails, don't excrete as much ammonium. Some of the snails produce less slime, but excrete a lot of ammonium. So there might be some trade-offs, and that's what's illustrated here. So here you have, this is this contribution difference of um, nitrogen excretion versus slime production. Turbine snails are um, excreting a lot of ammonium relative to slime. Litterine snails, and to some extent, limpets are actually producing more slime relative to ammonium. So you may have these trade-offs in the roles that these different grazers are playing. Um, and so I think that's particularly cool because it highlights a potential mechanism for grazer diversity. So some grazers are really good at recycling nutrients. Other grazers are better at mediating this spatial subsidy of new nitrogen, new algal biomass into the system. And it's that spatial subsidy that's necessary for you to actually create enhanced production associated with higher grazer abundances. OK. So those are the examples here, and it looks like I still have a few minutes left to talk to you about what's going on next. So um, one of the things that I've been playing around with is trying to understand how these types of interactions are affected by climate warming. Um, you know, so when you ask how climate warming could be impacting these communities, it could be altering species interactions, it could be changing movement of nutrients and energy in these systems. Um, and I've been tackling this using a comparative experimental approach, um, combining observations, sort of a space for time um, type plan, with experiments where I actually manipulate temperature in tide pools and study how that affects interactions between herbivores and algae. And so the observations, um, I've been doing measurements, and this is sort of the space for time aspect of it, doing measurements and comparisons at two locations on the California coast. Corona del Mar State Beach, which is where all those experiments that I was just showing you were based, and then up in Northern California, and there's a big gradient in temperature and nutrients, and I'm trying to tease out how those are affecting these interactions. So, for example, on average, the tide pools down here at Corona del Mar are about four degrees Celsius warmer, um, and the ones up at Bodega Marine Reserve um, in Northern California, um, nutrient concentrations are somewhere between seven and 10 times higher. So that allows me to tease out some of these different aspects. And then combine them with experiments, um, actually looking at responses to warming. And so um, at Bodega Marine Reserve, we did warming experiments where we increased tide pool temperatures by almost a degree and a half. It's really hard to do, but we were able to use um, these warmers and um, this box has a circuit board and batteries in it, and so that actually heats up the tide pool at low tide. Um, and so we were able to, and it does all kinds of cool and interesting things to the system that I don't have time to talk about today, but um, even warming these by about a degree and a half caused the system to change in a lot of ways. 
Um, we also manipulated nutrient availability. So we have these little dispensers in tide pools, and we put nutrients that are dissolved in auger in the dispensers, and then that slow releases nutrients into the pools over time. So we've increased uh, ammonium, nitrate, and phosphate concentrations depending on the analyte between two and seven fold. And then we manipulate herbivores like I showed you earlier. Um, so we use these fences and tiles and things like that within the tide pools as well. So it's a combined uh, warming by nutrient by herbivore manipulation. Um, and again, fenced versus unfenced tiles to assess those grazer effects. Um, and then manipulating herbivores at the level of tide pools, so removal pools and addition pools like that. The herbivore effect in this case is going to be the difference in the chlorophyll concentration between the matched fenced and unfenced tiles within these tide pools. And just to summarize, so at, um, we didn't do the warming treatment at Corona del Mar, number one, because it was a place that was already warm, and number two, because there are a lot more people there in Southern California, and there's no way that those boxes would have stayed on the rocks. People would have walked away with them. So we did a nutrient by herbivore by warming Manipulative, manipulative experiment here in, at the Dega in Northern California, and we did a nutrient by herbivore manipulation here in Southern California, and we ran these for a one month at each location. My initial prediction going in, because I think about nutrients a lot, was that the effect of nutrient additions on herbivory would be greater at Corona del Mar, where nutrient concentrations are lower. So I was expecting that by adding nutrients here in this low nutrient um, environment, I would cause um, a big, big effect on herbivory or a bigger effect on herbivory. But this is what I found. So this is the herbivore effect. So this is the difference between the fenced and unfenced tiles in terms of chlorophyll concentrations per area. But Dega Marine Reserve, Corona del Mar, so Northern California, Southern California, the minus nutrients treatment is in blue. The plus nutrients treatment is in sort of this pinkish reddish color. So at Bodega, there's a really big effect of nutrient addition. It enhances herbivory. So when you add nutrients, herbivores have a bigger effect in the system. But I didn't see anything like that at Corona del Mar. And so if you remember what I had predicted, that effects of nutrient additions on herbivory would be greater at Corona del Mar, I absolutely did not see that. So I'm like, all right, what's going on? Well, the other big difference between them, remember, is temperature. So Corona del Mar is quite a bit warmer than Bendigo, so maybe it's temperature. And remember, I also have a factorial warming treatment at Bendigo, so we can explore that aspect as well. And it turns out, so here's ambient versus warmed tide pools there. Again, the herbivore effect where nutrients um, are at ambient levels versus added. These are just the data I showed you before. So at ambient, nutrient, uh, ambient temperature, um, there is a strong effect of nutrient addition on the herbivore effects. But in warm tide pools, that difference goes away. So what this highlights is that um, the enhancement of herbivory due to nutrient addition at a cooler location is actually negated by warming. Um, and again, the kind of brings home this unfortunate fact that climate warming disrupts essential processes in ecological communities. So again, just started to dig into these data and explore mechanisms and things like that, but that's sort of where this research is headed right now. A few final thoughts. Um, typical perspectives on what consumers do in communities and ecosystems really emphasize the fact that they eat things, right? But what I think of, or at least I hope I've showed you today, is they do other things as well. They play important roles in nutrient cycling um, and um, this sort of novel and interesting thing that I hadn't anticipated, which is they can also enhance recruitment of algae into the system, so that's pretty cool. These positive effects can sometimes outweigh the negative effects. So thinking about the role that consumers play in facilitating um, primary producers as well as their consumptive effects. And that last example highlights the fact that interactions between consumers and resources are impacted by warming. So as the world changes, we need to take that into account. So when we ask 
about the consequences of the loss of consumers for how marine ecosystems function, we can't just think about their consumptive effects. They play roles from the top down, but they also play important roles in mediating bottom-up processes. And those roles can be as important as their top-down roles in the system. And all of these processes are potentially threatened by global change. And with that, I will be glad to answer any questions you have. Oh, I just wanted to highlight, I do have a postdoc opportunity in the lab groups. So if you're interested in these ideas, and particularly um, the work I'm doing now on scaling of seaweed functional traits, and it also involves herbivory and other stuff, um, come find me, talk to me, email me. So, thank you. Thanks a lot, Matt. Yeah. We have some time for, for questions. I'm also checking on YouTube if there's any questions in the chat. I can, I can start then, let people think about their questions. Um, it might be too early, actually, because it's, it relates to the next step that you're mm -hmm. discussing. But I'm curious if warming, if you know if warming is affecting um, the community equally. For instance, if the ammonia-producing species are more affected than the slime producing ones? It is. Do you think there's a, a That's pattern? That's a great question. I mean, so right now it was just all of the herbivores were manipulated, so it would, it would require manipulating the individual herbivores. But what we do know so far, just based on the analysis that I've done, is that it is affecting the herbivores. So algal growth is much, so basically it's, the herbivores are no longer, they're, they're being stressed, I think, and not consuming as much algae. Mm -hmm. And which herbivores exactly are, are responding, I'm not sure yet. Okay. Thank you. There's a question back here. Yeah, thank you. A nice experiments. Uh, they look challenging to me. So uh, <coughs> my question is that uh, razors and algae, they have an, an here and an inherent uh, population dynamics as well. So mm -hmm. grazers can be uh, low or high for a long time or a short time or acting impulses in the ecosystem. So what's the effect of the intrinsic dynamics of uh, algae and grazers interacting in these systems? Right. Um, that, that's a great question. That's sort of my, my initial thought on it. Um, so I went into this thinking that, okay, as grazers increase, right, they're positive effects are going to increase, but also their negative effects are increasing as well. And so, um, you know, they sort of cycle together in the system. The only way then that you're likely to get new material into the system and sort of go beyond that cycle and mediate increases is via this subsidy of new material into the system. So that's the other role that the grazers are playing. Um, I think one other important aspect of that is that multiple grazer species are affecting these processes and they're not all responding the same ways in space or in time. And so that would have to be part of that consideration of sort of the demographic patterns. Um, and I'd have to dig more into our data to sort of figure out exactly how that played out. But those are really important points and certainly something to think about. Yeah, well, well, I <laughs> Thank you for your talk. Yeah. Um, have you ever uh, tested whether these positive and negative effects of uh, consumers, and in particular the overall positive effect of consumer on, on weeds, uh, are density dependent? In, in other words, there is a density of consumers that turns the positive net effect to negative net effect because it's what I would expect. Yeah, I, I think it would... Um, you, you know what I mean? Yeah, is I, 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 know, I know what you mean. Um, and I think also it, it's sort of like the response that I gave to his question because it's different species are mediating different processes. You can talk about overall grazer density, but it's actually going to be down to the, to the densities of the different component grazer groups, especially if they're playing different roles in meeting in those processes. So, um, you know, does it tip from negative to positive? I think it really depends on 
the species and what they're doing in the system. Um, so the um, given that the nutrient the nutrient recycling um, the grazers are basically functioning as transformers of the nitrogen in the algal biomass into nutrients. That should that process should scale. Both of those processes should scale with density. I think at approximately the same rate, the consumptive effect and the um, the nutrient recycling rate. I don't know about the um, the spatial subsidy mediated by slime production. So that that would be a great question to try to figure out how many grazers does it take to actually cause new algae to move into the system? Could one grazer crawling around a lot generate as big an effect as a hundred grazers? And really, I don't know. So that'd be a great question. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. More questions? Oh, we have one here. <laughs> yes, where are you? Hi, thank you very much for the talk. It was really interesting. So um, are there any projections of climate change effects on these communities, on the grazers, um, in the near term, long term? Um, I think, well, it depends on location. Hmm. So Northern California there, um, it might actually get colder because of intensification of upwelling and increases in coastal fog because it creates a greater difference between the land and the ocean. Um, and so you actually I might have more cooling in that region, but Southern California could get much warmer. Um, so you get there actually might be there be differences depending on the location. How would that affect the grazers? Um, we already see in Southern California that almost all of kind of the measurable ecological action and interaction in the community happens in the winter months when it's cooler. And even if you have, I've seen times when it warms up in February or something like that, and you get um, an increase in temperatures that basically shuts the system down. So it could massively reduce the, really the productive window, which is already fairly small in that, um, you know, the Southern California, thermally stressful intertidal system. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Sorry. Yeah, thank you. Well, that's a, that's a silly one, actually. So in terrestrial ecosystems, a bad core can create a dramatic change in vegetation at a very local scale just because an input of limiting nutrients. Mm -hmm. Have you tested the effect of a bed snail in one of these pools to see the effect on the uh, algae growth? Of just one snail? Or a few. Um, I don't know if whether, whether you know, dead snails uh, can release nutrients or they can pollute the water and create trouble for algae. Um. So is this sort of, are you thinking about, I mean, like, I, like I said, I think most of the effects of these grazers scale with their density or their, their abundance in the system. So are the ones that are having a disproportionate effect? Is that what you're asking about? Yeah, but the, the effect of that is nails in the, in the water. The effect, you know, a, a release of nutrients just because of the decomposition. Of, uh, of the snails in the water. Oh, the, you mean the death of them? So if they, okay. Yeah. So if, uh, I think it would have, in this particular system, it would have to be pretty rapid because these are um, wave swept shorelines. And so when the tide comes in, it flushes the tide pool out entirely. And so a lot of those effects are going to be lost. It's not like, um, like in a terrestrial system where you'd have immediate deposition and that material, that nitrogen or whatever wouldn't be lost from the system, I think it gets flushed out of the pool pretty quickly. So we still have time for questions. I'm checking online. There's no question for the moment. Yeah, Monica. 
I echo what everybody said. That was a really great talk, interesting experiments, and really well presented. And I have a silly non-science question. Mm -hmm. I was just curious. It sounds like Corona Del Mar is a public beach, and so I was wondering about um, do people ever mess with the experiment? Do you have, like, how do you deal with the public going there mm -hmm. and wanting to look at the tide pools? Do you have signs up or anything like so, that? So, yeah, I, I actually view it as a good opportunity for outreach. Um, and I handle it in a couple ways. I mean, so most of the experiments are far enough out that only the more intrepid people will go there, which um, makes it a little diffi more difficult to get to. There are people who walk that stretch of beach every day, and we get used to talking to them. So they not only interact with us and learn about what's going on, but they'll actually talk to other people about what's happening. And then. Um, I put eye bolts, I drill them into the rock and put a little tag on them with a QR code that links to back to a lab website that talks about the work. And that ends up being the most clicked on site on my entire website is that, that sort of outreach aspect of it. So that seems to work too. I, I have very little, you know, in terms of actually these tiles and the fences and stuff like that, People leave them pretty much alone. I think they're interested in them, but they realize that there's something there. Now, if I were to put out the big boxes with the warming equipment and the electronics and stuff, I, I think that people would be more likely to, those wouldn't last very long. Big but expensive. Yeah, the expensive, expensive like, yeah, equipment like that. But, um, but this stuff, they, I, yeah, I think it's actually, it's cool to interact with the public and talk about the work. Thank you. So, do we have more questions from the audience? Yes, what? Thanks. Lots of cool findings. So you talked a lot about facilitation, mm -hmm. and I was wondering about the role of competition. So when you first mentioned this trade-off, uh, where the the fucus or the brown algae mm -hmm. uh, had a negative effect or grew a lot in the presence of the snail and the green, the palatable uh, algae uh, mm -hmm. was kind of the most consumed one. I immediately thought about that. So if the green algae is being consumed uh, and is competing with for space with the brown algae, the brown algae could be benefiting from uh, the released space. So it's kind of a more of a competition effect rather than a facilitative effect. And I was wondering about the role of competition in your, in your system, not only between algae, but also between snails. Mm -hmm. um, I, think, I think it's a good point over longer time scales. Those experiments that I showed you were three days long. So I don't think that in, in the, the algae weren't growing on the substratum. They were in those little tubs. So I don't think that was what was going on there. But I do think that over longer time scales, and it really is that trade-off between um, Olva is a more ephemeral species, fast growing, um, takes off a lot of nitrogen, that sort of thing. Fucus is more in it for the long haul, more slow growing, um, but it can, um, it can last for a long time on, low, on nitrogen reserves. So you do have those trade-offs that are you know, these different strategies, and those play out in competitive interactions as well. Um, in terms of competition between the grazers, um, I don't think that it's competition that's limiting abundances. I think that it's physical stress more than competition in this particular system. Um, when I look at it and think about what's determining how many live in these pools, I think it has a lot more to do with things like temperature than it does actual competition for resources. Um, but it would certainly be worth testing. Um, and, and, and I think it would, it would lead to a lot of other cool findings vis-a-vis -vis the system to do specific species, grazer species removals. Not only could you test competition, but you could also look at some of these other mechanisms about whether they're complementary in terms of their roles in the system as well. That would be cool. We can take one last question. But if no. No question, then I think we can thank you again for a very interesting talk. So thank you, Matt. All right. Thank you.